So we are going to be looking, as I've already said, uh, at uh, this name that was given to Jesus, uh, the Lamb of God. Uh, in Bible times, you may know that the name you were given was a big deal. Uh, some people spent a lot of time over it. You remember the story of uh, John the Baptist himself. His father was struck dumb at the time and not really able to say what he thought the name should be. Uh, but he gave him a name that had been provided by God for him. And uh, having obeyed, he was able to open his mouth and praise the Lord. Think of Abram. I heard a sermon on Abram once. It means father of many. And uh, he went through life having no children at all until a fairly advanced age, called the father of many. And I think he still had no children when God said, okay, we've now got this agreement and your name is not going to be Abram anymore, but Abraham, father of many nations. And, and the preacher on that occasion said, can you imagine what it was like for Abraham uh, to go up to others and say, oh, I've changed my name. It's not father of many anymore. It's father of many nations. And they said, oh, right. Uh, yeah. But of course, the Lord knew what he was doing. But the name, think of James and John calling down fire from heaven on a village that would not uh, receive uh, the Lord Jesus Christ or not receive them in his name. And uh, they, of course, had the name the Boanerges, the Sons of Thunder. Probably not a great name to be given if you're a Christian. Uh, but this has carried on over the centuries, um, even for us. We still have residues of a system where your name was directly related to uh, your occupation. Mr. Chandler, somebody who made candles. Uh, butcher, baker, Mr. Shepherd. Um, that's where these names came from. Uh, we don't do that anymore. Um, if we did, uh, we, might be able to, we might be introduced one day to Mr. Brain Surgeon um, or Mrs. Web Developer. Um, it seems to have dropped out of, of usage. But we still actually, some of us, if, if the Lord blesses us with children, we still take a little bit of time and we might look through long lists of names and, and, and then we'll look at the meaning of the name and we try and uh, come up with a name that doesn't inadvertently in some other language mean something like dog's breakfast because we don't want our children to go through lives with uh, an impediment like that. Well, now we come to the Lord Jesus Christ and certainly in Scripture we know how important names are. But considering who he is, do you think there is one name that you could give to him that would ever encompass all of his character, all that he is? Well, no, of course not. And that's why, I'm convinced that's why, uh, he has many, many names in the scripture because his character is, is uh, incomprehensible. Um, now, just to let you in on a little secret, so far I've got a list of about 110 of these, and this is number four. So at that rate, um, we could be in this series for a few years to come, but that's okay. Each of these names <coughs> tells us something about Christ. So if you want to know Christ better, there are far worse things you can do than what we're doing this morning. Spend a bit of time thinking about one of his names. Unwrap it. Try and, and see how much you can learn of him. Uh, and we've already done that. We began this series with that wonderful name, Man of Sorrows, that he was given in Isaiah. And then we went on to Friend of Sinners, which was a uh, a name he was given by his enemies in the New Testament, friend of tax collectors and sinners. Ha! Huh. A name that's very precious to us. And then uh, around the beginning of the year, we looked at the name Emmanuel, God with us. And we saw in how many ways we could understand that. 
Today we want to get into this name. I've been wanting, um, wanting to deal with this for a few months now. Um, my only fear is that you know, how can you do justice to the Lord Jesus Christ? And um, Let's pray that uh, the Lord may take me out of the picture uh, so that all you can see is him. I've already told you it was the name by which John the Baptist introduced him to the nation of Israel when his ministry was beginning. It's in John uh, 1 and verse 29. And uh, this is what it says. The next day, he, that's John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What I want to do this morning is something a little bit similar, a pale reflection of what John the Baptist was doing. I want to introduce you to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to use this name to do it because it meant something to the people of that time when Jesus was called the Lamb who takes away sin. And so let's just spend a few moments meditating on that now. The first thing, and this will be no surprise to anybody in this room, if I asked you and you shouted it out, it would probably, the, probably be the first thing you would say. It meant sacrifice. Because in the Old Testament, it was a very common uh, offering to the Lord. It was always amongst the acceptable offerings to the Lord, right from Genesis 4. And verse 4, where Cain and Abel bring their offerings to the Lord. And Abel, on his part, also brought of, see what he brought? The firstlings of his flock. Those are lambs. Abel brought lambs and, and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for it. He accepted it from Abel. And he had regard for his offering. And when uh, the uh, tabernacle worship and the temple worship was brought in, lambs remained an acceptable part of the burnt offerings to God. Numbers uh, 28 and verse 3, You shall say to them, this is God uh, speaking to Moses, This is the offering by fire which you shall offer to the Lord. Two male lambs, one year old, without defect, as a continual burnt offering every day. Every day, lambs being offered. And we read um, the, the account of the institution of the Passover, Exodus 12. Let's just remember verses 6 and 7. You shall keep it, the lamb, until the 14th day of the same month, then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it at twilight. Moreover, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. So over the course of the years, hundreds of thousands of lambs were offered up and their blood was spilled out. in order to provide an outward cleansing of sin. But they never took sin away. And the writer to the Hebrews has told us that's why they had to keep on being offered, because people knew in their hearts that they had been made outwardly clean to live in the presence of God, but their consciences weren't clean. They still felt the guilt of their sins. But what John is saying when he introduces Jesus to Israel is, look, here's the Lamb of God. Those were your offerings to God. Here is an offering that God is going to make to himself. 
And whereas all those offerings couldn't take away sin, here is the one who takes away the sin of the world. His sacrifice will put an end to all the others because his will do what they could never do. So look, says John. Pay attention. There he is. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So he's a sacrifice. And that's what that name should have made abundantly clear to the people in that day and it needs to be abundantly clear to us today. But we can unpack the name a little bit further and see what kind of a sacrifice he was going to be. Because in effect John was saying, look, the sinless sacrifice of God. You'll have seen it in the passages that we've already read, but we'll look at some and emphasize it uh, to get the point now. The lambs for the burnt offerings and the lambs for the Passover had to be without spot and without blemish. Numbers 28 verse 3 again. You shall say to them, This is the offering by fire which you shall offer to the Lord. Two male lambs, one year old, without defect as a continual burnt offering on every day. Don't bring the blind, the lame, the sick, the mutilated, the leftovers, the dregs, the sacrifices that are brought to me, says God, must be outwardly without defect, no blemishes, perfect. So when... John calls Jesus the Lamb of God. He's telling us that this Jesus is without defect, that he is perfect. Listen to how it's put in 1 Peter 1 and 17 through 19. If you address as Father, the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless. This one, John the Baptist is saying, is perfect. He has no sin. You will never find a witness who can come and make a valid accusation against him. Nobody will ever be able to call him up and say, we saw what you just did and that's sin. Because he had no sin. And if he had no sin, it meant that he didn't have any cause of death within himself. You need to stop and think about that. Jesus had no cause of death within himself because death is caused by sin and he had none. Now it's stating the obvious as to the divine person of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he never has had sin, he never will have sin. He is eternally pure and holy and spotless and righteous. But he came into the world as the man Christ Jesus, placed underneath the law, and he had to be spotless in that situation too if he was going to be a savior. He couldn't have any of his own sins, otherwise he'd have to die for them. He couldn't die for you and me. He had to live in our place, under the law as we are under the law, and he had to do it as we never can do it, without spot, without blemish, without defect. So his blood, Peter is saying, is not just any blood. 
His sacrifice is not like anything that came before. God offered up a perfect life. He poured out precious blood, infinitely precious, priceless blood, so much so that it could save a multitude for the glory of God. And that is all bound up in this name, the Lamb of God. So look at him this morning, the spotless Lamb of God. It also means that he was a spotless sacrifice. It means also that he was a submissive sacrifice. John was saying, in effect, look at the submissive sacrifice of God. They had all these ideas, as we know at the time, that Jesus was going to come and he was going to be a savior to take the people out of the tyranny of Rome. He was going to beat the Romans over the head, lead a rebellion, and restore things the way that they thought they ought to be here on earth. They should have known when John the Baptist called him the Lamb of God that he was never going to do that. He wasn't going to give his life as some kind of noble sacrifice in an armed combat with swords and spears and shields and things. And that somehow in that act, uh, Israel was going to be delivered from Rome. No. Uh, and they should have known that as the Lamb of God, he was not going to offer any resistance to the authorities in this world. Isaiah 53 verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. This is Jesus. Yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers. So he did not open his mouth. He was, he's talking to his disciples. He's saying, you went out before, you didn't lack for anything, you didn't have to take a sword or anything like that, but now times are changing and if you've got a sword or if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak, buy one. And the disciples are so full of enthusiasm and they say, look, Lord, we've got two swords. And he says, that's enough. Two swords against the Roman Empire. Yeah, that should do it. He's saying... Times are dangerous for you. You need to be able to defend yourselves as you've never had to do before. He's not saying he's going to lead a military uprising. And when they come to arrest him and one of his disciples takes out his sword and hacks off the ear of the high priest's servant, Jesus says, stop. Put up your sword. And he heals that uh, cut off ear. And he says, those who live by the sword are going to die by the sword. It's not the battle he came to fight and he yielded himself up to his enemies. Would not defend himself before the authorities. Matthew 27, 11 through 14. Now Jesus stood before the governor and the governor questioned him saying, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said to him, it is as you say. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? And he did not answer him with regard to even a single charge. So the governor was quite amazed. As a lamb and as a sheep is silent before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. Because the battle he had to fight was not of this realm. He'd come to overcome the prince of darkness and to set his captives free and overturn his tyranny. To do that, he had to be spotless and to do that, he had to be submissive to the will of his father. He had to cancel the debt that his people owed to the law of God by dying on the cross he had to live a spotless life in their place. And this was God's will. And he had to be 
submissive to it. Even though, as he told his disciples, don't you think that I could call on more than 12 legions of angels and that they would instantly be here to deliver me from this situation? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? Nobody took his life from him. He willingly submitted to his Father's will and offered it up. And that's what John is saying when he calls him the Lamb of God. All that submissiveness is built into that name. He had to submit or Satan would not be defeated and there would not be a sacrifice that could save anyone. So look at him. Behold, the submissive sacrifice, the Lamb of God. He's also a substitutionary sacrifice. That's what John was saying. Look at the sacrifice who is a substitute. Now hopefully we all know uh, what a sacrifice is. If you've watched anything of the World Cup, you should know that very well by now. You remember that player for Brazil, Neymar? He's the, the real, the latest megastar of the Brazilian soccer team, I guess. And uh, in one of the games they were playing, I mean, it was a pretty brutal game. And he was tackled, and the player on the other side basically put his knee right into the guy's back and broke uh, one of his vertebrae. And he had to be carried off the pitch because he couldn't carry on. He, he was crippled by that injury and couldn't continue. And so they brought on somebody to take his place wasn't as good as he was most likely but he came in and he stood in his place and played the rest of the game in his place as his substitute well now Jesus is way better than any of us and we're crippled by our sin and we can't do uh, we, if, if all we had to do to, to, to save ourselves was raise our little finger by a, a micrometer we couldn't do it. We had to have somebody who would be our substitute and who could come in and do that for us. And Isaiah 53, if you need any evidence that what Jesus was doing on earth was doing something in the place of his people, here it is. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging we are healed. You get the point. I won't read the rest of that passage. Uh, but do please look it up. It's a wonderful passage. He was not punished for anything he did. He was punished as a substitute for you if you've put your trust in him. The punishment that you should have had, he stepped in and he took it upon himself. The Old Testament sacrifices are full of that idea of substitution. The death of a spotless, submissive one that had done no wrong, providing blood to cleanse the sinner. And so the Lamb of God was destined to take our place. He was destined. We talk about how, and we can't really understand this, what it must have been like to be righteous, as righteous as he, and to even come into a world that is so sick with sin. Where would he look and not see sin? Every day it must have been a torment to him. But he had to do more than that to be our substitute. That was part of his substitution. He had to live that perfect life. But then he had to die. And it's like we talk about the filthy rags of our righteousness. We put on his wonderful robes. He had to... Can, can you imagine picking up a, a stench? Some kind of a garment that's been tossed around in all kinds of unspeakable filth that you can't get within 30 feet of it. 
without feeling like you're going to throw up. And he goes up to a garment that's far worse than that. It's your sin. And somehow, this is why he sweat drops of blood in the garden, by the way. Somehow, he picks that up and he puts it on and he appears before God on the cross. And God pours out his wrath because of the vileness of that sin. He took the responsibility. He became the substitute. He bore in his body on the cross the punishment that your sins deserved, that my sins deserved. He received the wages from God that should have been paid out to you. Look at him. Behold, the Lamb of God, the substitute. See him on the cross. It's for you. It's your fault. It's your fault Jesus went to the cross. My fault. Wouldn't have had to go there if you and I had not sinned. If there was going to be any salvation. It's your fault and mine. That he hung there. You know, we often, t- at the Lord's Supper, which we'll come to this evening, we read the words of the institution. Jesus says, this is my body, which is, and, and some, ver- some passages in Scripture say, broken for you. But he also says, this is my body, which is for you. It's in your place. My body, in your place, broken. The substitute. Enduring hell so that we might be blessed in heaven. Well, and the last one is it's a saving sacrifice. I hope you've noticed uh, the S's here. Spotless, uh, submissive, substitutionary, saving. I couldn't find a word for redeeming that, that began with an S, if I'm honest. But G- uh, John the Baptist was saying, look, Uh, the sacrifice who buys you back for God. Deuteronomy 9, verse 26, I prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord God, do not destroy your people, even your inheritance, whom you have redeemed through your greatness. When? Whom you have brought out of Egypt with a mighty hand. It's the Passover lamb. God bought the nation of Israel to be his in a special way. They became his people. They belonged to him. And he did it, as we've already mentioned, at the cost of the blood of the Passover lamb. So when Jesus dies on the cross, and when he as the lamb of God sheds his blood, he does in a much more glorious way something similar. He buys people for God. He redeems them. He buys them back. Their possessions were born into this world, the possessions of Satan. He's the tyrant ruling over us as we come into this world. We don't mind that. In fact, we're quite keen on it. We're very willing slaves of Satan. But the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ, buys us out of that slavery and makes us bond slaves of God instead, which actually is true freedom. Uh, 1 Peter 1.17 again. Uh, Skip down uh, to verse 18, in fact. Uh, Knowing you were not redeemed, with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood, as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. I've highlighted a few words there so you get the the direct sense of what Peter is saying. You were redeemed with precious blood, the blood of Christ. Redeemed. Purchased. Bought. He gave his life so that he might own yours. 
That's a test of where your heart is with God. Do you rejoice that you are owned by Jesus and that he bought you with his blood and that you are not your own? So look at him. Behold the Lamb of God paying the price to purchase you for God if you have given your life over to him, turned from your sins and are depending on him uh, to save you. Now some people in the room here this morning are still slaves of Satan. You think actually that you're not. This is a master deception on his part. Because all the time you're in this bondage and slavery, you actually think you're free. You actually think it's Christians who've, who've put, them, put shackles on themselves. But you have no freedom. And that's very easy to prove. You can't stop sinning, can you? I challenge you today. Spend the rest of this day and don't sin once in thought or word or deed. See how far you get. See if you can make it even to, to when we sit down at the meal table and have lunch. See if you can last that long. Because pretty soon what you're going to see is pride and jealousy and malice and envy and lust and anger come out. And you'll have sinned pretty soon. And actually, this takes about a heartbeat or less. You won't have loved God with all your being. That's sin. Pretty soon, you'll see your hatred and contempt for God come out. And you'll give expression to them, either in, in the things you say or, or in the way that you behave. You can't stop sinning. In fact, you don't want to. You actually like it. But don't tell me you're free. You're a slave. And you better recognize that. And your slavery is from a tyrant who is only concerned to destroy you and to mock God. One more soul that Jesus didn't save. Is that what you want to be? The only way to be truly free is to be a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. It sounds a bit curious, but it's true. That's freedom. So if you haven't come to him yet, you need to come right now. Well, let's have a so what. All right. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So what? Well, let me introduce you to him, this Jesus. This spotless, submissive, substitutionary, saving Sacrifice. If you have not yet met him here this morning, please let me introduce you to him. Will you receive him? On the basis of what we've seen is tied up in this name, the Lamb of God. Because in effect, what he's doing right now is reaching out his hand to you for you to take hold of it and shake it. It's a handshake of salvation and of fellowship. Now, even in our society, if I came up to you, or let's put it the other way around, if you come up to me and you hold out a hand and I turn my back and very pointedly won't take your hand, how do you feel? You're offended. In fact, when we've got a cold and we don't want to spread the germs, we, we, make, we make it very clear that the reason we're not able to take the hand is we're, we're trying to keep our germs to ourselves. So even here in this society, we understand the offense of an offer of fellowship 
being rejected. How do you think Jesus feels when every week from this pulpit he reaches out his hand to you and you turn your back on him? What an offense. Well, here he is reaching out his hand to you today. Have you got a good reason to turn your back on him? Do you? No, there is no good reason. There's no one else who's going to be able to take hold of you. Remember when Peter stepped out of the boat and he's looking around and he's going out to walk on the water to Christ and suddenly he takes his eyes off Christ and sees the storm and he starts to sink and he says, Lord, save me. He reached out his hand to Christ and Christ just grabbed him and plucked him up out of the water. Well, here's Christ reaching out his hand. Take it. No one else can save you from the sin that's in your heart, from the slavery that you're in uh, to sin and to Satan. Don't turn your back on him. Uh, Believers, I want to reintroduce this Jesus uh, to you this morning. What a wonderful Savior he is. Look at him. See him spotless for you. He lived that life for you. He came into this world and lived under the law and earned righteousness for you. Submissive for you. He submitted to his father's will, yes, but for you he submitted to his enemies. The creator was nailed to a cross by his own creatures and he allowed it to happen and he didn't call for those 12 legions of angels to come. And it was for you. He was there in your place, receiving the punishment your sins should have had. Look at him this morning. He's reaching out a hand of fellowship to you. Maybe your heart's cold. Maybe you've been living another life and not the life he wants you to live. He's reaching out to you. Take his hand. Join him in that fellowship, that that, that handshake, you know, we call it the right hand of fellowship. Take his hand. Live for him. Love him. You could ask for no better savior. Now I want to anticipate uh, the sermon two weeks from now, Lord willing, because lambs are all soft and cuddly and fluffy, right? Right? And, and sometimes we, we see a little child, and maybe it's just a UK thing, um, and we say, oh, what a, lovely, what a little lamb, okay? So clearly, when John introduces Jesus as the Lamb of God, we're supposed to see Jesus as this kind of meek and mild and fluffy and cuddly person and completely safe, utterly harmless, right? Well, for the moment, he is here to save. His hand is reached out to you. But there's a passage we're going to look at um, in a couple of weeks' time, Lord willing, where he's introduced to us rather differently. The lion of the tribe of Judah. And the, the person turns around, having been directed to see the lion, and he sees the lamb looking as if it had been slain. We're going to look at passages that talk about Jesus trampling the winepress of God's wrath and spattering his garments with the blood of the souls who he is punishing and upon whom the wrath and the justice of God is being poured out. So don't mistake the character of Christ. You may come to him today and he is the lamb and he will take away your sins. But don't wait until that day when he is the lion and when he is the judge whom God has appointed uh, to conclude the age and to bring in justice and righteousness and to condemn those who have perpetually refused to take his hand and have always turned their backs 
on him. Let's spend a couple of moments in quietness and we'll think about these things together.